Te voy a ir por instrumento que se me atrasca. No, no estoy ingresado. Escucho mi música. أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على رسوله الكريم وعلى آله وأصحابه أجمعين رب شرح لي صدري ويسر لي أمري وحل العقدة من لساني يفقه قولي اللهم أخرجنا من ظلمات الوهم وأكرمنا بنور الفهم وافتح علينا بمعرفة العلم وسهل أخلاقنا بالحلم وجعلنا مما يستمعون القول فيتبعون أحسنه اللهم اجعل أعمالنا خالصة لوجهك ولا تجعل فيها حظا لغيرك وصل اللهم على سيدنا ونبينا ومولانا محمد وعلى آله وأصحابه أجمعين والحمد لله رب العالمين السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته كيف حالكم؟ أزور وان؟ كود؟ الحمد لله رأيت Not yesterday, the day before we started the discussion on Hikmah number 13, right? And just a reminder, we, you know, we're reading these sayings of this person, pious person, Ibn Atai Layl Iskandari, uh, not for no reason, like, not because we think this is wahi or anything like that, right? We read these sayings because they are expressive of a state of a person that was journeying to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala according to the Qur'an and the Sunnah of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, right? And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us in the Qur'an, in Surah Al-Fatiha, we ask Allah to guide us, Sirat al-Mustaqeem. Ihdina Sirat al-Mustaqeem, Sirat al-Ladheena an'amta alayhim. The path of those who you have favored upon. So because, not us per se, but many Pious people before have recognized Ibn Atayillah rahimahullah ta'ala to be a pious person and his sayings to be inspired sayings, manifestations of a state of nearness with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in his traversing to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the manner taught to us by Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam according to his sunnah and according to the teachings of the Quran. We read these sayings so that we can perhaps share in that experience. And we can learn from it and journey to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in a similar manner, inshallah. So, in this 13th saying, uh, or 13th hikmah, he says, كَيْفَ يُشْرِكُ قَلْبٌ صُوَرُ الْأَكْوَانِ مُنْطَبِعَةٌ فِي مِرْآتِ How can a heart be illuminated? Wherein... The forms of created things are imprinted on its mirror or are reflected on its mirror. Am kayfa yarhalu ila Allahi wa huwa mukabbalun bi shahawati? Or how can it journey to Allah whilst it is shackled by its desires? Am kayfa yatma'u an yadkhula hadrat Allahi wa huwa lam yatatahhar min janabati ghafalati? Or how can it hope to enter the presence of Allah whilst it has not yet purified itself from the impurity of its heedlessness? And how can it hope to understand the subtle secrets whilst it has not yet repented from its uh, sins or excesses or its slip-ups, its offenses. 
Right. So in our last lesson on Thursday, we discussed the first part of this. How can the heart be illuminated when that heart reflects the forms of other created things? Right? And we spoke about the different parts of ourselves. We spoke about that year in we're focusing on the qalb, the spiritual heart, not the nafs or any other part of ourselves. And we said that that spiritual heart, um, as opposed to the aql as well, it is the place of emotions. And those emotions reflect the things that it is focused on. And we said the heart is like a single-faced mirror. And whatever it is, it has placed before it, or whatever it is directed towards, that is what it will reflect. And if there's anything covering the surface of that mirror, anything selling that surface of the mirror, then it will not be able to reflect any light beyond that uh, layer of solidness. And we said that is essentially the darkness that may cover the light from being reflected in that mirror is all created things. But we also spoke about the fact that There's a potential for goodness in everything, right? But we'll we'll discuss that again, inshallah. So he says, كيف يشرك قلب صور الأكوان منطبعة في مرآة? There's a problem here. You want your heart to be illuminated. You want your heart to reflect the divine light. But how can how is it possible if your heart has in front of it all created things? Not necessarily all. Whichever ones appeal to you. That's what, that, that's what your heart has in front of it. But then he goes on and he says, أَمْ كَيْفَ يَرْحَلُ إِلَى اللَّهِ وَهُوَ مُكَبَّلٌ بِشَهَوَاتِ Why do you have created things covering your heart? Or barring the light from reflecting in the mirror of your heart? You have those things imprinted on your heart on account of your desire. The reason that you, you, instead of focusing on Allah, instead of your heart being turned towards Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and reflecting the divine light, our hearts are turned to material things, work, goals, whatever things that we, we place before us. Right? So those are created things. But why are those created things Barring the light from entering on account of our desire. They don't, they don't in and of themselves bar us from seeing the divine light. Right? A person can have a car, a nice car for that matter. That doesn't mean anything about his relationship with Allah. It doesn't intrinsically, in and of itself, bar, one from, bar one's heart from reflecting the divine light. The only reason that it would come between himself and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, come between his heart and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, is if his relationship with that thing is based solely on his desire. Because now what happens is, not just does he have that thing, or does he want it because of some need that must be fulfilled, but he, he becomes desirous of that thing. He hankers after it. He longs for it. And those are emotions that are supposed to be exclusively for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So the, the second part of this hikmah is actually giving you the reason for the first part. The reason that the forms of created things are reflected in our hearts are because of our desires. Because we are overcome with our desire for those things. Not because they exist or because we have them. But because we are overcome with our desire for those things. And then he says, he, so, so, he, so he says, the reason your heart mirrors those things is because you are imprisoned by your desires. Then he says, how can he hope to enter the presence of Allah? If he has not yet purified himself, from the impurity of his heedlessness. And Sheikh Bouti rahimahullah ta'ala, in his commentary on this, he says that this third line, this third line 
is also a reason for the second line. What does he mean by that? What is heedlessness? Heedlessness is the opposite of dhikr. Ghafla is the opposite of dhikr. So he says, the reason you are overcome by your desire such that your heart reflects the images of created things is on account of your heedlessness of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, is on account of your lack of remembrance of Allah, your lack of you know, thought about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You see, the, like I told you before, there's different levels. There's one thing focusing with the mind, and then that, then there's the, the reality of that becoming the reflection on your heart. So he's saying your heart is reflecting created things because of your desire. And the reason you are overcome by your desire is because you are heedless of Allah. Right? Because you are heedless of Allah. And I said heedlessness is the opposite of remembrance of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Opposite of your mind focusing and thinking about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And that being present on your tongue as well. And in, in the last line he says, أَمْ كَيْفَ يَرْجُوا أَنْ يَفْهَمَ دَقَائِقَ الْأَسْرَارِ وَهُوَ لَمْ يَتُبْ مِنْ هَفَوَاتِهِ And how can he hope to know this, the subtle secrets when he has not repented from his offenses, his sins? So, Shabuti says similarly, this last line is the reason for the line before that. He says that, The reason you find yourself in a state of heedlessness, lack of remembrance of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, is because we are engaged in sins. And the sin may be apparent or the sin may be subtle. The sin may be apparent or the sin may be subtle. It might be a sin of uh, maybe, I'm, maybe I didn't make my salah. Maybe I didn't make my salah on time. Maybe I... Um, what are this? Maybe I spoke ill of somebody. Maybe I thought bad about somebody. Maybe I thought myself better than somebody. Maybe I unreasonably have hatred towards my Muslim brother. So those are all sins that we can be engaging, ranging from the apparent to very subtle. Maybe I'm chatting up females that I shouldn't be. Maybe I'm wasting all my time. Those are all sins ranging from the apparent to subtle. But he says on account of the engagement in these sins, right? The, that is the cause for our heedlessness of Allah. And our heedlessness of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is in turn a cause for us being shackled by our passions. And us being shackled by our passions is what causes the forms of created things to be reflected in the mirror of our hearts. So what's the solution then? If there's a causal link between all of these things. So if you want to then have all that he speaks about here, if you want to have an illuminated heart, what do you mean by illuminated heart? A heart whose mirror reflects the divine light. Right, who's focused on Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, then reflects nur. And I don't mean this in a physical, we're not speaking of physical things, right? Am kayfa yarhalu ila Allah, or you want your heart to journey to Allah. Am kayfa yatma'u a yadakhula hadrat Allah, or you want to enter the presence of Allah. Am kayfa yarju a yafhama daqayq al asrar, or you want to know the subtle secrets. You want any of those things. Then you have to break that. You have to go to the very beginning of that chain of, 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 of cause and effect. And you have to break it from the very beginning. So it was the murder reflecting the forms of created things on account of desire or being overcome by desire. Overcome by desire on account of heedlessness. Heedlessness on account of errors and sins. Right? And that's barring you from firstly under, having deep understanding and then being in the presence of Allah and then journeying to Allah nearer and nearer and then your heart reflecting the divine light. So how do you solve the whole thing? If there's a causal link between all of these things, 
the advice there in is stop sinning. Stop sinning. Because if you stop sinning, then you have a word, you offer and you make and you repent from your sins. You stop sinning and you repent from your sins, then that will take you out of a state of heedlessness. And if you firstly, if you stop sinning and you make and you repent from your sins, then it will allow you to have good understanding because you're constantly turning back to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Understand the subtle secrets. Once you understand the subtle secrets, it will take you out of a state of heedlessness. If you are taken out of a state of heedlessness, right, then you will be purified from that state of heedlessness. If you are purified from the state of heedlessness, then you are ready to be enter the presence of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. If you enter the presence of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, then you can hope to be freed from the shackles of your desires. If you can hope to be freed from the shackles of your desires, and then your heart will focus on nothing other than Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and your heart will in turn become illuminated. Right? But now, we understand that causal link between these things, and at the end of it, we arrive at the fact that we must stop sinning. And somebody may think to themselves, well, maybe I'm not engaged in major sins. So how does this apply to me? Well, maybe you engage in subtle sins. Maybe you engage in subtle sins. Maybe you engage in minor sins. And maybe you are engaged in what is, sin, what is a sin for you at your level. Not really a sin, but not the ideal. And I mentioned before last year, Hasanatul uh, Abrar Sayyatul Muqarrabin. Hasanatul Abrar Sayyatul Muqarrabin. The good deeds of the pious are the sins of those who are extremely near to Allah. The good deeds of the pious are the sins of those who are extremely close to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. What do I mean by that? I don't mean it's really a sin that they're going to get punished for. But when that person who's really close to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, when he misses the hajjud salah, then he feels as if he had sinned. He feels as if he fell short in his a relationship with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Right? But if a normal guy like me, Mrs. Tajud, doesn't give it a second thought maybe, because you know, you're not at that level. But once you become mutawid, once you're accustomed to that, then when you leave out those excellent things, those things that are to us, things of excellence, then they will feel as if they sinned. But the nature of that relationship with Allah is, that for you to journey closer, for you to journey closer, you must, it's as if, you know, it's as if the sin at that level for the, for the muqarrabin is like a sin to him. He must free himself from those sins. He must be consistent on his tahajjud. And then he will journey closer. Just like for us at the very, or like myself at the very low level, perhaps it will be that if we refrain from uh, a certain type of sin, then that will be enable you to draw closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But there's levels in closeness. And we can always continue growing closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So there's always a type of offense that we can think about. There's always a type of heedlessness. There's always a type of being veiled from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that we can think about. And we must focus on where we are at our level. Right? We must focus on where we are at our level. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala doesn't burden us with anything beyond that. So what do I mean thereby? If I'm somebody that's struggling to make my salah on time, I, my focus can't be on making tahajjud. My focus must be on making my salah on time. Because that's my offense. For me at that level, tahajjud is... is very much extra. I must focus on making my salah on time. That's my offense. And when I'm free from that offense, 
It will take me out of what is heedlessness at that state, at that level. And when I'm out of heedlessness at that level, you know, I can enter a new vista in my relationship with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And that perhaps, perhaps in that level, when I reach a higher state, perhaps in that level, I'll become focused on maybe the internal, the sins of, of, of the heart of hatred and hatred and enmity and, you know, kibber, etc. and jealousy. And then I must work on those forms of offenses. And then it will take me out of heedlessness at that state. And it will allow me to enter a new vista in my relationship with Allah. But if you want to journey to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala correctly, you must focus on where you are at your level. Right? Otherwise, what you will do is, in the ladder of priorities, you will get things mixed up. You will be standing on the lowest rung, and you will be trying to jump to the top rung. And when you do that, you might very well slip and fall. But if you just focus on the rung one step ahead of you, it's manageable, and eventually you will get to where you want to be. Right? So may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala guide us in that. But it's easier to say, stop sinning, than it is to actually do it. Because our fitrah and our nafs, as I mentioned before, it is... In its nature, it inclines to these extremes. The extremes that represent sin. So I can say, whatever it may be, stop talking ill about people. It's easier to say that than it is to do it. Maybe if you take somebody that watches pornography, it's easier to tell him, stop watching pornography, than it is for him to stop. He's addicted. His nafs is a beast. It's overcome with, he's overcome with, uh, you know, desire to go to that thing. And he's in fact maybe experiencing glimpses, moments of uh, the divine breezes wherein he knows that thing is wrong. But he's actually in prison, he's actually shackled. He's addicted and he can't break free from that addiction. Right? But all is not lost. That's why he says at the end, he doesn't say, he, he doesn't clearly say stop sinning. I'm telling you, if there's a causal relationship between them, then the the ideal thing is to stop sinning. But it's easier to say stop sinning than it is to stop sinning. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala created for us something in between. Something in between stop sinning and sinning. And that's Tawbah. Right, so he says, "Am kaifa yarju ayyafah madaqayq al asrar, wa huwa lam yatub min hafawati." He doesn't say, "How can he hope to understand the subtle secrets if he hasn't stopped sinning, he hasn't stopped his offenses?" But he says, "If he hasn't made tawbah from his sin, because Allah knows us." Allah knows that though we may be overcome with our passions and our desires, we experience this, those moments of divine light. When we, when we, in our moments of sincerity with Allah, when we're experiencing you know, the rays of our heart shining through, that we recognize, I don't want to be there. I may be sinning Allah, but I don't want to be sinning. And then we ask Allah, we turn back to Allah and we ask Allah, Oh Allah, please forgive me. Oh Allah, please forgive me. And you turn back to Allah. And in fact, the fact that you turn back to Allah is a sign of acceptance from Allah. ثُمَّ اللَّهُ عَلَيْهِمْ لِيَتُوبُوا Allah says. Then Allah turned to them so that they could turn back to him. Right? So, so we might be sinning in whatever kind of sin it is, but we don't want to be there. 
in the moments that we come out of the drunken stupor, out of our addiction for even momentarily, when we come up to breathe, then we turn back to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And that is a sign of acceptance from Allah already. But what happens then? When we make tawbah, what does that tawbah mean? It means we regret what we did. It means that we ask Allah to forgive us. It means that we say to our Allah, Oh Allah, I make a resolve never to do that thing again. Oh Allah, I've, I regret it. Please forgive me and I'm never going to do it again. That's what tawbah means. But we know ourselves. We say that with sincerity. Yes, we mean it. But perhaps our nafs is too strong. Perhaps we are too addicted. And then what happens? We fall again. But when we fall again, then we turn back to Allah. When we fall again, we make tawbah again. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, when He says that, when he speaks about his quality of, of accepting tawbah, he says that he is tawwab. He doesn't just say ta'ib. He's the one who accepts the repentance. He says he's tawwab. What does tawwab mean? In fact, he uses the same form for his name, ghaffar. What does ghaffar mean? What's the, what's the secret in the form of that word? You, we know, those of us who know some Arabic, ghafara means what? To forgive. A ghafir is one who forgives. Taba, okay, has layers to it, meaning it literally means to turn. It can mean to repent or it can mean to accept repentance. So a ta'ib would mean the one that accepts repentance. What's the difference between ghafir and ghaffar? What's the difference between ta'ib and tawab? When Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala speaks about those names for himself, then he says he's tawab. He says he's ghaffar. What does that mean? He forgives you again and again and again and again and again. He does it repeatedly. Whenever you fall, He forgives you. Whenever you turn back to Him, He accepts you turning back to Him. That's the meaning of tawab. He does the act of tawbah repeatedly. How many times is there a limit? This is Siratul Mubalagha. He does it infinitely. He does it infinitely and so the first we recognize that causal link and so we we conclude that we should stop sinning but stop stopping sinning is not always easy it's too hard so allah gave us something in between and what is that tawbah so we make tawbah to allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and we realize that rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam taught us that the one who makes tawbah from his sin is like one who had never sinned. The one who, look at that. Look at that. The one who makes tawbah from his sin is like one who had never sinned. Yes, if there's a worldly consequence to your thing, maybe you stole something and you need to be imprisoned, you'll be imprisoned. We're not going to say you made tawbah so you don't go to prison any longer. You're going to You killed somebody, there's a had for you. You're going to get the had. We're not going to say you made tawbah so there's no had for you. You know, there's a hadith about a sahabi who raped a lady. Not just did he have zina, he raped a lady. And then some other companions went after him and they caught some other people. They weren't sure exactly who it was. So they took the person, the people that they identified to the lady, the Sahabia. And she identified which one it was that raped her. But she identified the wrong person. Right. So they were going to exact the had on him. They were going to give him the death penalty, stone him to death. The wrong guy. And you know the had, it happens in public. 
It's an exemplary punishment. People must see it so that they're put off from it. So the Sahabi that did actually perpetrate the rape, he was in the gathering. And before they could exact the had on that person, he made tawbah and he, and he confessed and he said, no, it was me. So they took hold of him and they applied the death penalty to him. They stoned him to death. But after he was stoned to death, so the worldly punishment was meted out to him. But after he passed on, Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said that he made such a tawbah that it would suffice for the entire Medina. Right? So Allah doesn't expect us to be perfect. <clears throat> but Allah expects us to try. You see, if when you are embarking upon a sin, you are fully mindful and you are in full control and you say to yourself, I'm going to choose the sin over Allah, then that's a grave state to be in. But what normally happens when we sin is, we're not thinking like that. What normally happens when we sin is, momentarily we become unmindful about Allah. So we give in to our passion. We don't tell ourselves, we don't tell ourselves, right now, I'm going to do this thing and I'm going to prefer this over Allah. <clears throat> no. That's a grave state to be in. Normally we don't sin like that. The way in which we sin is, we're overcome by our passion, we become unmindful of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and we give in to our passion. We give in to our passion. And afterwards, perhaps even sometimes while we're sinning, we, our mind becomes again a remembrance of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and then we feel bad and we feel regret and we make tawbah to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Right? So, Allah doesn't expect us to be perfect. And this is what Ibn Atayillah is telling us. Ibn Atayillah is telling us that there's a causal link between these things. But if you want to start on the journey, you must make tawbah. And if you want to start, you must make tawbah. And when must you make tawbah? You must make tawbah time and time and time again. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was perfect. He did not sin at all. But he sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, Inni atubu ila Allahi fi al-yawmi mi'ata marra. In some narrations, akthara min sab'ina marra. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam would make tawbah to Allah. And this is not a tawbah of repentance from a sin. Because Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam had no sin. But it's just a turning to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And again, you know, this is also has some metaphorical meaning because Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam's heart was never turned away from Allah. Right? When we speak about when we speak about that, you know, uzla and presence with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, then some people, I don't know if Mullah Muhammad mentioned to you that one uh, from the Maktub of Shaykh Ahmad Hindi, that, that you must be ka'inun ba'in. You must strive to be ka'inun ba'in. Ka'inun ma'allahi ba'inun an khalqihi. Present with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and absent from his creation. Right? Present with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and absent, absent from, your, from your desire. Cut off from your desire. Right? But Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa was like that. He was never absent. He, he interacted with people but his heart was always with, with Allah. So, and that's what it means to, for him to constantly be in a state of Remembrance of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. What's the point I was making before that? Yes, Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, despite not sinning, he taught us that he would make tawbah in a day a hundred times. In other narrations, more than 70 times. And 70 is indicative of a large number. So if that is the state of the ma'asum sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, the sinless one, then what is our what should be our state? Turning back to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala constantly. Constantly. Not perfection. Not perfection. Turning back to Allah. 
But when you're sincere in that tawbah, when you sincerely experience that regret, and you're not like somebody who tries to just remove the regret or paper over, cover over the regret to feel good about yourself. No, you're somebody who appreciates that regret in that moment because that, that moment of regret, that in reality is, that's the core of tawbah. And nadma to tawbah. The regret that you experience, that in reality is the tawbah. So we experience that regret and then we turn back to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That is what is pleasing to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And in doing that time and time after again, perhaps you have a sin that you struggle with. You struggle with the sin. You make the over from the sin. You regret it. What you have at the fore of your mind is, you know to yourself that I need to stop this thing. And the only reason I'm not stopping this thing is because I'm overcome with my passion, I'm addicted and I, it's too hard for me. But I know I must stop it. I know I must stop it. And a person tries and tries and tries again and eventually, by the grace of Allah, the norm is that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala takes you out of that sin. You may have other sins, you may have other things to deal with at that level, but Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala takes you out of that sin. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, your love for Allah causes a break in that addiction. Your love for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala causes a break in that addiction. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us in the Quran, this is the state of a believer. وَمِنَ النَّاسِ مَنْ يَتَّخِذُ مِنْ دُونِ اللَّهِ أَنْدَادَ Allah says, from mankind, there are those who set up with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala opponents or partners. وَمِنَ النَّاسِ مَنْ يَتَّخِذُ مِنْ دُونِ النَّاسِ أَنْدَادَ They are from amongst mankind those who take opponents with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. يُحِبُّونَهُمْ كَحُبِّ اللَّهِ They love them like the love of Allah. يُحِبُّونَهُمْ كَحُبِّ اللَّهِ They love those things that they set up, those things that they are to attracted to, like the love of Allah. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَالَّذِينَ آمَنُوا أَشَدُّ Allah says, Allah says, وَالَّذِينَ آمَنُوا أَشَدُّ حُبًّا لِلَّهِ Those who believe, they are more intense in their love for Allah. More intense than what? Allah leaves it unrestricted. Whatever you can place after it. Those who believe, they are more intense in their love for Allah than, than anything else. Whatever else they are, maybe find some degree of attraction to. They love Allah more. وَالَّذِينَ آمَنُوا أَشَدُّ حُبَّ لِلَّهِ those who believe, they are more intense in their love for Allah. And in that ayah, there's an indication that there might be, your nafs might still be have love for other things. You, you might allow to enter your heart love for other things. But you never let the love for that thing overpower the love for Allah. Ideally, you want to have all of those removed from your heart. But nobody starts there. Nobody starts there. So it might be that there is love for other things in your heart. But the state of a believer is such that his love for Allah is always more intense than whatever else is there. 
And in reality, that tawbah, that tawbah that you do, that regret that you feel, is indicative of your love for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala more than that thing. More than that thing. And when you make that tawbah, you strengthen that love for Allah. And when you strengthen that love for Allah, eventually, eventually, it obliterates the love of all other things. It obliterates the love of all other things. So initially it might be, as you are journeying towards that, it might be that there are competing loves, but you ensure that the love for Allah always triumphs. And tawbah is an expression of that. Right? But what happens is, you then start to realize, you start to understand the subtle secrets that he speaks about here. And that subtle secret is that even the favors that you have, whatever pleasure it is that you try to experience, you start to recognize that these pleasures, they come from Allah. In every single thing there is a sign that indicates to the oneness of Allah. So when you, when you turn yourself to some pleasure, when you turn yourself, even if it's, even if, you know, when, when you start on this journey of Tawbah, that journey of Tawbah takes you out of doing things that are haram. But then, when you're out of doing things that are haram per se, you might be busied with things that are halal over Allah. You may still have love for other things, competing with your love for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, those, those things are halal. They're not haram. But you still want your love and your attachment to them to be obliterated by your love for Allah. So what happens is, you start to recognize that these pleasures that I have, that are permissible for me to have, they are gifted to me by Allah. So how can I love the gift more than the giver? And these are the secrets. That we start to understand. How can I love the gift? How can I love this mubah thing that is given to me by Allah more than the Allah that gives it to me? And then our love for Allah becomes preponderant over that. And so whenever we have a favor, no, whenever we have any situation, we look for Allah in it. Allah, you know, when I get a car, Oh, the first thing I say is, Alhamdulillah, MashaAllah. You praise Allah for, for giving it to you. When you see something good in your child, then you thank Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for it. You don't enjoy it for it itself. You recognize it to be a, a favor of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and then you enjoy it. And eventually then, the love of Allah gets haymana. It gets authority, widespread authority over your heart. And the love for Allah obliterates the love for anything other than Allah in your heart. And then you interact with everything only to the degree that the love for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala dictates. You interact with everything only to the degree that the love for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala dictates. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala help us in the journey. I think our time is up. But I'm going to just read the next hikmah because it ties in very closely with this one. It ties in very closely with this one. So he says next, Al-kawnu kulluhu dhulmatun. Al-kawnu kulluhu dhulma. The universe, the cosmos, Al-kawn, kawn means kullu ma siwa Allah. Everything other than Allah. That's the kawn. So he says, Al-Kawnu Kulluhu Dhulma. The universe, all of it is darkness. In wa innama anarahu dhuhuru al fi. And the only thing that can illuminate it is the manifestation of Al-Haq, of Allah. Al-Haq is the name of Allah, the true reality. The only thing that can illuminate it is the manifestation of Al-Haq in it. فَمَنْ رَأَى الْكَوْنَ So whoever sees the universe وَلَمْ يَشْهَدْ فِيهِ أَوْ عِنْدَهُ أَوْ قَبْلَهُ أَوْ بَعْدَهُ Whoever sees the universe وَلَمْ يَشْهَدْهُ 
but he doesn't witness Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in it or by it or before it or after it or yeah what he means by yashhadhu not just witness but who doesn't contemplate him his mind doesn't witness Allah and his heart doesn't witness Allah so he says whoever sees the universe and while seeing the universe, he does not see with, his, with the eye of his mind and his heart, he does not see Allah in it, or by it, or before it, or after it. So then how in need that person is of light. It has rendered him in deep need for light. He's telling you that if you can see the universe but you can't see Allah, then your sight is encompassed by darkness you are in need of light and where do you get this light whomsoever Allah doesn't give light to whomsoever Allah doesn't make a light for then there is no light for such a person so فَقَدْ أَعْوَزَ وُجُودَ الْأَنْوَارِ وَحُجِبَتْ عَنْهُ شُمُوسُ الْمَعَارِفِ And that person has been veiled from the sons of gnosis, of knowing Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. How? بِسُحْبِ الْآثَارِ بِسُحْبِ الْآثَارِ By the clouds of created things. Athar, athar literally means the effect or trace. So why does he refer to him in this hikmah as traces? He refers to them as traces because Allah is the creator of all of them. He is the cause and they are the effect. So he says, the clouds of effects, they have veiled him from seeing the light of the sun of Gnosis, the sons of knowing Allah. The existence, he sees the effects of the sun, but because of the clouds, he can't see the sun. Because of the clouds, you can't see the sun. And what are the clouds? The clouds are in the reality, the effect. The cloud, the sun, is what allows the water to be drawn up. What do you call that process? Evaporation first. right? Evaporation and then condensation takes place. So the evaporation was caused by the sun. And that allowed the clouds to exist there. But now the clouds exist there. And you can't see the sun. You're ignorant of the sun. You act as if the sun didn't exist. So he says, whoever can see the universe, but can't see Allah, in it, by it, before it, or after it, that person is in need of light. He has been veiled from the sons of Gnosis. And the clouds of the effects have veiled him from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So again, you can see in this hikmah, what is Ibn Atayla rahimahullah ta'ala guiding us to? He's guiding us to the point that I made earlier. وَفِي كُلِّ شَيْءٍ آيَةٌ تَدُلُّ عَلَىٰ أَنَّ اللَّهَ وَاحِدٌ All of the universe's effects. In everything in the universe, you should try to look for, you should try to look in it for something that indicates to Allah. And it's not hard. Because its very existence indicates to the existence of Allah. You can look at this thing and you can say, this thing, it is a contingent existence. It needs something else to exist. The egg didn't come out of nowhere. There must have been a chicken. But the chicken also couldn't have come out of nowhere. There must have been an egg. And either there's an infinite cycle of chicken and egg, or at some point there was a beginning and the beginning couldn't have been a chicken or it couldn't have been an egg. And the same can apply to every other thing in this world. And then you will realize at the beginning of all of it there must have been a cause that was not an effect. And that cause we call Allah. You can do the same thought pattern for the wall, for the clock, for the wood, for the plant, for the, my child, for the light, for anything. وَفِي كُلِّ شَيْءٍ آيَةٌ تَدُلُّ عَلَىٰ أَنَّ اللَّهَ وَاحِدٌ 
In every single thing, there is a sign that indicates, that directs you to the world, towards the fact that Allah is, exists and Allah is one. So may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala never let us be veiled by the clouds of effects such that we become blinded to the cause. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala let us not prefer the effects over the cause. And may our hearts always find more love for Allah and more love for Allah and more love for Allah. <coughs> Are there any questions? Nothing on that? Any questions? All right, then we're in there for now. You know, I think this is very apt also. We potentially, could potentially be Laylatul Qadr tonight. And the dua of Laylatul Qadr is what? Allahumma innaka afuun. Oh Allah, you are the one who is infinite in your pardon. Your name is Al Afu. You are the one who pardons and wipes away. Allah. You love pardoning. Rasulullah tells us that if we never sinned, then Allah and if we never sinned, then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala would have destroyed us and replaced us with the people who sin so that they could make tawbah. Because of how much Allah loves tawbah. Allah. You love pardoning. You love wiping away our sins. You, because that's indicative of our love for Allah more than anything else. You love pardoning, O Allah. So pardon us. Wipe away our sins, O Allah. So hopefully, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, on account of our reading of this hikmah, enable us to turn to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in better ways tonight. With greater sincerity and a heart full with greater love for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, such that we find only acceptance from Him. And we find only forgiveness from Him. And our necks are freed from the hellfire. And our hearts fly towards Him. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala accept. Wa jazakumullah khairan wa akhiru da'wana. Alhamdulillah rabbil alameen. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah.